prone to wander, Lord. I feel it prone to leave the God I love. How many of you have been there during the course of this week? How many of you with, with great joy in the mercies of God and the faithfulness of God have made a plea to him, oh, here's my heart. <laughs> in the midst of those torn allegiances, take it, seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Torn allegiances, fractured loves. Now God has told us you should love the Lord your God. You must, in fact, love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all, all, and all. It doesn't leave much room from the overflow of that. The natural outworking of that is simply that you love your brother as yourself. He says you can't love God and money because eventually you'll learn to love one and hate the other. And it may not be something where you hate, hate. It's just that you learn to love one and forget the other. thereby showing the other really doesn't matter. Lord, have mercy on our torn allegiances. We begin a study in minor prophets today. Hold on for the ride. We're studying the minor prophets from today through the end of November. Minor prophets can be heavy. And by heavy, I mean convicting. Well, I've wanted to study these minor prophets because I, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, because I want, I want to know a timeline for the future. Sorry, that's not what you're going to come into contact with here you're going to come into contact with the Holy Spirit teaching us about ourselves right here, right now, in this culture. And today, as we begin, you tell me if you cannot hear God speaking to us in the first 11 verses of Haggai. Turn there with me. Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, really in short form tell the whole of the content of this prophetic book. Haggai is just a little bit before you get to the New Testament. Okay? Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, this is what the Lord of hosts says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore... <clears throat> This is what the Lord of hosts says. <laughs> Consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. 
You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one seems warm. <clears throat> and he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. This is what the Lord of hosts says. Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. I did this. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labor. Father, teach us. Guide us as we consider our ways. For the sake of your name. Amen. Verses 1 and 2. You have the general indictment of failure. The date is August 29th, 520 B.C. And the voice of the Lord is going to speak through Haggai. This is not myth, it's a real date, in a real time, in a real place, with real people. Darius is king of Persia. There is political stability. Cyrus has been used of God in order to give the decree that the people of God should go back to Jerusalem and build, restore the temple of the Lord. But it hasn't happened. Haggai, don't know a whole lot about him. The people, what we do know, even though some may read this and say, boy, the people were in hardship, if you read it that way, you aren't reading it the correct way. Has there been some difficulty? Well, yeah, there's been some difficulty as judgment from the Lord. But overall, as you look at verse 1 and then you look again at verse 9, you collectively, the people, these are people of at least moderate affluence. Not just the governor's home that has paneling. Other homes are doing pretty well. And even though this command was given, that you are to rebuild my house, the people objected, verse 2. They objected saying it was not it just wasn't the right time to build the house of the Lord. Now, there's no indication of when they think the right time may be, but they are sure in this moment that this is not the right time to build the house of the Lord. For clarity of what's going on in the entire book, and for clarity of what's going on in these first 11 verses, the reality of their decision to not rebuild the house of the Lord as he commanded points to their disobedience to that very obligation that God himself had given to them to restore the temple. We know the command was given. We know God is the one who decreed it. We just 
Now is not the time. Now is not the time to give ourselves to full obedience to God. In order to understand what's in play here, turn back with me to the book of Ezra. Some of this I have already said, but I want you to see it in the text of Holy Scripture. Ezra chapter 1. First, I want to read verses 2 through 4. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord. If we are in this throng of people, we would be rejoicing right now. Rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of this place, of his place, with silver and gold, with goods, with beasts, Besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem, everyone lend your aid, gather together, go back home, and build the temple of the living God. And as you can imagine, there'd be quite an energy and resolve. You know how it is when things first begin. There's an excitement, there's an energy, there's a sense of urgency because all that we have been told and taught, recognizing that while Cyrus made the decree in verses 2 through 4, it was indeed the directive of God that was behind all of it, verse 1, Ezra 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that Cyrus made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. This was God's doing. And the people of God knew it. There is no way that the king of Persia is going to say, I've got a great idea. Why don't you people who have been held in captivity go back to your homeland and build a temple to the God? God put that in his heart. Why is that important? Because the people knew this was not just a decree that Cyrus had made. This was a calling of God an obligation that God gave them in a command to rebuild his house. So what happened? We started out with such fervor. Obviously, a lot of people went back. Obviously, a lot of people had homes. They must have been engaged in the economic society of that community because they had some money. They were busy with their own houses. They were building their own stuff. They were eating, they were drinking, they were clothed. What happened? What happened to that urgency? What happened to that sense of calling that God has sent us on a mission? Ezra 4 speaks a little to that. Why is the temple not yet built? Verses 4 and 5. The people of the land in which they were now when they went back, 
The people of the land discouraged the people of Judah. And they made them afraid to obey God's command. They discouraged the people and they made them afraid to build the house. You know what else they did? They bribed counselors against them for the purpose of frustrating their purpose. All the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Why was the temple not built yet? Why was the house of the Lord not built yet? Well, because the people were met with some opposition. And because they were met with opposition, it was easier to step back, step down, step away from God's calling and say, I don't need the hassle of engaging God's mission if it's going to cause me to regularly come into contact with the opposition of other people. I'd rather things be easy. After all, God wants me to be happy. And opposition doesn't make me happy. Opposition doesn't make us happy. Can everybody in the house say amen to that? And how many times? How many times have we quit? How many times have we walked away? How many times have we stopped? Or just settled? Because of opposition. The second thing that we read in, in Ezra 4, verses 4 and 5, some legal roadblocks seem to have been put in their way. They bribed counselors to speak against them. They had great legal force in the area <clears throat> that sought to argue cases in court against the people doing what God had called them to do. This doesn't sound relevant for 2023 at all, does it? I would rather, <clears throat> I would rather take my faith and remove it from the public arena and keep it private so that I don't have to face the scrutiny and all of the forces in the society that stand against me, including the court system. So we'll keep our faith private. We'll go and we'll retreat into our paneled homes. We won't do the work that God has called us to, but he'll understand. Because I fear people more than I fear God. So the initial excitement to obey God's command and build his house, it lost its steam. And eventually the claims of God no longer had priority in the hearts and minds of the people of God. It was lost. As one commentator stated, there was no suitable time to men who are uninterested. There is never any suitable time to do the work that God has called us to for people who are truly uninterested in the God who has told us to do these things. I told you the minor prophets are tough.
It hurts here. Haggai is one of those examples of a pre-contemporary apathyism. It's not that we don't believe God exists, we do. We just don't think he matters very much. See, brothers and sisters, it was never so much about the house. <clears throat> it was never so much that the house of the Lord should be sought after for the sake of the house itself. That's not the issue here. That our priority should be the house of the Lord. And yet the house of the Lord is supposed to be a priority. Why? Because the house was the outward form of the very real presence of God among his people. This is the whole deal here in Haggai. Why does God want this house built? Because it is a visible display that I am central in your midst. To refuse to build the house is to say it really doesn't matter if God is in our midst or not. We're doing pretty okay without him and his house. Or perhaps worse, we thought that God would be pleased with us as we determined how we would worship him on our terms rather than being faithfully obedient to his terms. I know what God said. But he's going to be pleased. He's going to be pleased with this. But you're not building this house to show the visible presence of the Lord in our midst and that he is central above all. Right? What's your point? God will still be happy that his people are in the city. To not build the house, to not build the house of the Lord was to not want the Lord as himself. I'm willing to craft him after my image. I just don't want him as he has revealed himself. Verses 3 and 4. What a probing question. Amen? The people have said, it's not time. This is verse 2 again. These people say, the time has not come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And the Lord asked this question through Haggai. Verse 4. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? What a probing, convicting question. So you don't deny that you have time. When you're saying it's not time to be, rebuild the house of the Lord right now, you're not saying it's not time because there isn't time. You're saying that there isn't time to do it because I'm spending my time doing other things. That there are other priorities that are more important than God, more central than the one true living God, more important than the God who gave himself for you, more important than the God who redeemed you. Look at how he says this in verse 4. You have placed you, yourselves, he's really hitting us. 
you have placed you, yourselves, and your comforts, paneled houses, before your holy obligation to obey God's commands, whose house still lies in ruins. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on us. This is a national failure in verses 1 through 11 and throughout the remainder of this prophetic book. It's not just a governor. It's not just those in authority. It is a national failure failure. There's a reality of misapplied priorities. You have time for you yourselves. You've made time for your comforts. So what you're saying is you have time for everything but me. misapplied priorities. Verses 5 and 6. We see this in verse 5. We'll see the language again in verse 7. This is what the Lord of hosts says. It is time for us to collectively take stock. Consider your ways. In light of the question that was just asked, which pointed to the reality that everybody has time, it's a matter of how they appropriate that time, and they will appropriate according to their priorities and what they value. And you are clearly showing that you don't value me, but you value you and your comforts. And the Lord calls us and takes us to task and says, okay, before me, consider your ways. Let's take a moment to appraise the situation. You have found no fulfillment in all of your hard efforts. I'm not saying you haven't worked hard. You've worked hard, but you've found no fulfillment in it. And again, as we said before, this seems to be less about real hardship. They have paneled houses after all, and more about being or remaining unfulfilled. Would you at least agree with me? They had seed to sow. The text gives clear indication of this, right? They had seed to sow. They had food to eat. They had wine to drink. They had clothes to wear. They had employment What they did not have was true satisfaction. They tried hard. They sought after it. But they didn't find it in all their hard work. The problem was not the lack of goods. but rather the lack of the good. And God, as the prophet reveals, God is behind these shortcomings. 
God has acted within his created order to cause some of these shortcomings that brought about a sense of unfulfillment in the midst of his people. You understand, brothers and sisters, their gross national product as a society was really dependent upon not only what they had for themselves, but what they would export in agriculture. And the exporting is poor right now. What they put into their crops, this is what the text is saying, what they put into their crops was not commensurate with what they got out of them financially. We keep trying, we're sowing the seed, we're putting money into it, we think the more money we have, the better it will be, the bigger our house can be, the more satisfied we will be, the more happy we will be, and we keep doing this and we find time after time that we are not fulfilled in all of this. And we are not getting out of our crops everything that we're supposed to. And God is in the heaven saying, you think? See, the crops did not fail. They just didn't do as well as what we would have liked. They just didn't do as well as what we would have expected. The portfolios, if you will, didn't fully fail, but they certainly didn't do as well as what we would have liked or what we would have expected. And to top it all off, brothers and sisters, the end of verse 6, to top it all off, inflation was high. Ah. That's the last phrase of verse 6. I'm earning the same amount of money, but my money doesn't go as far as it did. It feels like I have holes in my pockets. Tell me again the Haggai doesn't have anything to do with 2023. These are conversations that I hear all the time. Again, personal demand for things was great. The people always wanted more to eat. The people always wanted more to drink. The people always wanted more to wear. We had never have enough food, never have enough drink, never have enough clothes. Again, it's not that the people were going hungry. It's not that the people were going thirsty. It's not that the people were naked, but rather that they never had enough of what they wanted and wanted and wanted. They had goods, but not the good life that they wanted. They had food and were not hungry, but they were also not satisfied. They were dressed, but not with the comfort that they desired. Inflation was just the straw on the camel's back. You wouldn't believe what I paid for these eggs. Again, as the prophet says, you would think there's a hole in my purse. This is what the Lord of hosts says. Verses 7 and 8 now. Consider your ways. Let's make clear what needs to take place. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. Really pretty straightforward, don't you think? Just do what I sent you on a mission to do. Just obey me. 
take what is near, build the house. In order that I would take pleasure in it, and in order that I would be glorified. Because when the command first came, and the calling first came, you were excited about it. You were energized by it. You wanted to participate in it. Because you wanted me to be glorified. Consider your ways. Repent. Do what I've asked you to do. In verse 8, you think about what's there. We have the stones around us from the destruction of the first temple. What a great place to begin the work. Agreed? We've got some of the fundamental materials right here with us. Ezra chapter 3, verse 7. Heavy timbers had previously been imported. So we have heavy timbers here. And other wood could be found in the hills of Judah. Which is what he's calling them to do here in verse 8. Use what is already at your hands. Well, now's not the time to begin the work because we don't have everything that we need. God has given everything that his people need to faithfully obey him every single day. Take what is around you and faithfully obey God. Use what is already at your hands, the Lord of hosts says, and begin the work to which I've called you. Please understand, God is less concerned with the size or the magnificence of the house as he is about the very existence of the house. Because again, the existence of that house is an outward sign that these people desire, they want, they yearn for the one true living God to centrally dwell in their midst. That, to apply a non-theological term to God, that makes God happy. Verse 9. There have been consequences for these misapplied priorities. Your disobedience in being all about your name, your kingdom, your will, your house, and not being about faithfully obeying, building my house. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, you probably thought it was just market systems that were in play. God says, I blew it away. You probably thought, oh, nuts, another Earth Day has passed us by. And Mother Nature just didn't, didn't work with us this year in the crops. And God says, you're simply attributing to science what was my work and my will. And why did I do it, declares the Lord of hosts? Because my house still lies in ruins. And the people who are supposed to be living in accordance with and for the sake of the glory of my name have been about their own. 
You've cared nothing about my house. But you've made time. You've given energy. You've spent money. Your value is being shown clearly that you're far more concerned about you than me. So for the record, that's why, God says, knowing that your GNP is agriculture, that's why the heavens above you have withheld the dew. And that's why the earth has withheld its produce. See, in verses 10 and 11, we see God's judgment against the people's failure. In verse 9, again, God was saying, the very lack of your fulfillment in your life that emphasizes you and your comforts is a result of minimizing the centrality of my name and my glory. Yet, perhaps, we think we can do it on our own if we can just get all of our proverbial ducks in a row. We have the intellect, we have the will to correct things and to course correct in order to make everything better. If we can put our collective minds together, we don't really need God. We can come up with good answers. And only if the government could do that and, and us and local communities could do that, we could push God out onto the fringes. And it's what we have done. God's judgment against the people's failure in verses 10 and 11, there is an important lesson in humility here. As some have stated better than I can, the system we live in, the system we live in, whether seen in terms of economic laws or market forces or natural laws and the weather conditions, is sovereignly managed by a holy God and the whole thing thing serves his moral purposes. The entire problem exposed to us here is that God was involved in the system, but he was not made a priority of the people. The house of the Lord could wait. And we could, we could afford to let it wait until later. Because we were, we were busying ourselves with anything and everything but God to make ourselves more comfortable and seemingly more successful. The fact was that at some point, God was involved in the system but he had ceased to be in our midst among us. And we didn't even notice he was gone. To leave God's house unbuilt was our way of saying it does not matter if God is with us or not. Let's consider our ways for a moment, shall we? The language of the United States of America is the language that has really infiltrated the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America.
if we could just work to get the living conditions right, chapter 1, verse 4, If we could just work harder to get the economy right, the beginning of verse 6. If we could just develop a decent standard of living for ourselves, the rest of verse 6. If we could just negotiate and legislate proper wage rates, the last phrase of verse 6. If we could do all these things, then, then maybe we could make time for God. Then maybe we could make time for obeying Him. But right now, we've we've got to get our personal and economic houses in order. Because that's more important than God. I'm not saying those things are not important. God is telling us that it's misapplied priorities. If only we could take care of all of this, then maybe we could have time for God. You know, brothers and sisters, the Lord God has never tolerated a society that runs in accordance with these priorities against him. We need to consider our ways as the church of the living God. Because either God will be central or he will be at odds with us. And we with him. I'm going to ask you to leave quietly this morning as you pray. To hear the words of the Lord one more time, let's collectively consider our ways. Where are our torn allegiances? Our double-souled love? What needs to change? so that we faithfully obey God and are centrally surrendered to his name, his kingdom, his will, his house. Not centrally about our name, kingdom, will, our house and our comforts. What has to happen for you to be all in? on the mission that Christ has given to us. Let's consider our ways. As you're done praying, quietly leave the sanctuary and head to your ABF rooms, please.